you could hear the drums all over the community. This is us, this is our own. You start to love it and you just can't stop doing it. Butterball um, was, as I said, again, more of a showman, and uh, it was a more of a happier time. Whenever we went to play somewhere, uh, the people wanted to see Milton Norwood or Butter Butterball as much as they wanted to hear the core play. People came out to see him, and the drum corps was just followed, you know. I mean, he was a good leader. Uh, Milton started off, he started off, too, as a bass drum player. And uh, at some point during that time, he uh, took over as a leader. He was swift on his feet, a big, heavyset guy. Could move like, a, like he weighed 10, 15 pounds, you know. He, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I expect a better ball because he was an older member of the group. As far as the, the, he was also ahead of me in school. Um, but... Um, I respect him because he gave me a chance to, to be the drummer that I eventually became. Um, I love Butterball. You know, he was, um, he was just good people. Butterball, he was, he was a leader, but he wasn't a leader. I don't want to take anything away from his greatness, but he wasn't the type of leader that me and Bud are. Me and Bud, are the type of leaders that we create music. Butterball was the type that the drummers would create the music and he laid back and suck up the gravy. And I remember uh, uh, the time that we won the Bud Billiken in, in Chicago. Uh, Butterball stopped the bus uh, prior to entering into, I believe it was Washington Park, and he he asked us to, to get our drums from below the bus, and uh, we didn't quite know what he meant. Um, and he took the drums out, we took the drums out, we put them on the bus, and he said, now when the bus pulls into the park, start playing. So when we entered the park, we were already playing, and people could hear the sounds of the drums, and um, Butterball, uh, uh, when, the do when the door, we stopped in the bus, and the door uh, of the bus uh, open, uh, Butterball would get off with his handkerchief and, and wiping his forehead and just kissing all the ladies and, and they just loved him. They just loved him. I mean, he, he, uh, he, was, he was in a class by himself. Uh, that is not to say that uh, uh, Bud Johnson uh, was not a good leader because he was. We wore army uniforms, uh, we had a regimen that we had to stick to and, and those kind of things. So it was just a different style. I really didn't choose to be a leader. Just kind of through attrition, uh, I think that I, I realized that if I wasn't willing to step up and take over the position of drum corps leader, that the drum corps was going to fall, was going to fail. And I didn't want to see it fail. I didn't want to give up my drum either, because I thought I was a tough drummer. I didn't want to give up 
playing the snare or tenor or whatever was necessary. Uh, it wasn't something that I desired to do, but my military experience did help. I thought that I knew I knew how to keep the drum corps together. I knew how I knew what it took to be a leader. Jesse was one of the fellows that I had to work one of the hard, really work hard with him. But Jesse was determined to be a, a, a drummer. He just wanted to drum. And uh, he, didn't have, he didn't have natural skills, but he was willing to learn, spend the time after practice, to stay, and he worked hard. I mean, he'd get frustrated with himself, but just, you know, just determined he was going to uh, be a good drummer. Jesse was a younger uh, drummer. He came in um, uh, about the tail end of, of, of my time with the Corps. And I, I, he, he, he didn't come in by himself, he came in with his brother. And I think there's a relationship between uh, the Ratliffs and, uh, and the musician from Champagne, Jack Macduff. Uh, but they all had a, they had a natural rhythm. For them, it wasn't trying to get the rhythm down, it was trying to learn the numbers. Because you had to keep all these numbers in your head, and when somebody called Bo Diddley, Bo Diddley, Bo Diddley, you know, Bud would call that, and you, that meant that you played a certain certain thing. Um, but with Jesse, Jesse, uh, he just had a natural ability, and so he just had to learn to learn the numbers. Um, and he has continued that, and he's, now he's, I, I understand, he's trying to uh, keep the core going by providing leadership to the core. The most real big involvement with the Majorettes was going to New York. I mean, that was like going to Hollywood. I never left Champaign, and, and to me, going to a big city like that, it was just like we were, we were important, people were waiting to see us, you know, stuff like that. It just, as a child, it made, um, made you have a high self-esteem about that you were going to be doing something positive. The Majorettes uh, was the uh, drill team that uh, that was with us. Uh, they was very good. They um, danced on our music. Uh, and so when we got ready to perform, a lot of time they would key their steps and their routines to our numbers. If we play Bo Dilly Bo Dilly, where where have you been? Boom to boom to boom to boom boom to boom to boom to boom to boom boom, and they would key their steps and their routines to what we were playing. We would listen to their sound, and their sound would, would make our movement, would make your body want to move because of how they would play those drums. They would play them with, out of their heart. They played them, you know, would come from out of the side of them. They just didn't go tap, 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 tap. They were like bang, bang. You know, they was just playing really things they felt. And I think sometimes when people play instruments, just like people sing, they play what's inside of them. It comes out in their music. We had won almost every uh, competition that there was to win in the Midwest. Uh, Chicago, Peoria, uh, wherever we could go regionally, we had won just about everything. We had to raise, uh, I think, $3,500 to take that trip. Uh, and because it was a national competition, we, um, we were very excited. But we, you know, it was really interesting because we washed cars, we went door to door. Uh, at some point, the community locked into it. Robeson's department store, Link, the Lincoln Square Mall, they all got out front and began to raise money for us. Uh, the Optimist Club of, of uh, Champaign decided they would give us matching funds. So we were, ge we were geared, our goal was to raise about $15,000. And obviously, a bunch of young kids, we didn't have the potential to raise that kind of money. So they wound up kicking in some money. I can just speak for myself. I didn't think that we would win because we would, we were competing against 346 uh, 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 drum and drill teams across uh, the country from all 50 states, and uh, I, I just didn't think that we would win. Uh, it was just a, a, a joy to, to go and to be able to compete. Um, but we got into competition uh, with some very, very good uh, drummers. Well, I would preach to the guys not to be afraid. Not to, not to worry about challenges they had to face, but the one who faced the biggest challenge was me. 
because I was looking at those leaders and they were they were really sharp. I knew they were sharp. I knew those those hoops were tough, and they had practice. I'm sure just as long and as hard as we had. Uh, but I could not let it show. I could not show how intimidated I was by some of those guys come by high stepping. I mean, uh, and using the batons and stuff. We had no baton, uh, and I didn't think we needed one. But uh, the dress, you know, the outfits that they wore, uh, the quality of their gear, their equipment. I think a lot of things. Uh, we, we were just not only were we intimidated, we were impressed by them. I mean, the good they were actually good, but we felt, like I said, that we felt like we were the best. But before we left, um, I had a bad cold, and it was in the summertime. And when I got on the bus, I caught pneumonia with the air conditioning. So I was in bed most of the time. That the kids were out having fun in New York, uh, and it dawned on me that in order for me to be ready to go for the parade Saturday, that I needed to get my rest. So while they were out uh, sightseeing and touring, I was laid up in the bed so that I have enough energy to, to uh, get out and march with them. Uh, I think Terry Townsend was preparing to leave in case I couldn't make it, because I was really sick uh, and didn't have any medication or anything. But um, as it turned out, uh, I did get up and march in the longest parade I'd ever been in. But the parade in New York was long enough. You could probably wrap that around the moon, too, a couple of times. We had uh, chaperones who would uh, march ahead of us about a block or two, and they would let me know when the judges were, because they had judges throughout the parade. And they'd go out and kind of check it out, and they'd say, hey, bud, there's a judge around the corner. And I remember we got to uh, the judge's uh, table or whatever, and uh, uh, before we went past the judges, we were given time to collect ourselves and, and, and get our routine down. And, and, and Bud had been sick for the, our entire trip. And he said, well, pretty much we, we had a number called XX, and I was the lead drummer for that. And the, 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 the way we played the, 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 the number was that I started playing, Bud called the number, I started playing the number by myself, and the other drummers would gradually fall in. You can't drop your drumstick, you can't be out of step, you, you can't have a crooked line. You got to be sharp, you got to be tight, you got to get in, hit your number, and get out. So we started playing XX, and I think we all just said, hey, let's just let it go. And we did. And we won. And it was um, unbelievable. Um, and we got back to the hotel. And uh, Walter Cronkite, Cronkite uh, a national, uh, uh, you know, he was the anchor for CBS News. He talked about us on national television, and that was really a thrill. Um, it was the highest honor that uh, the drum and drill team had, had won. Uh, um, I think at that point uh, we were just all trying to determine if, if it was true, uh, but we did win. And uh, <laughs> when we got ready to return home, they put um, stories in the paper that we had won and that we were coming home uh, at a certain time and you know everybody was calling New York. Uh, for some reason, uh, the state police, uh, they, they they picked us up at the Illinois-Indiana state line, and we had a police escort home. We had a one state trooper, uh, one, one, one state police car in front of the bus and one in the back, and they brought us on home. And when we got to uh, Douglas Center, there was just this sea of people. I mean, there was just, uh, I mean, you just could see people all over the place, and it was just a thrill. It was as if we were the final four and we had won uh, uh, NCAA championship. It was almost like the president, if somebody was important coming, we, we just felt like we were important. And that made us feel good about ourselves. But nobody up there had any more spirit than we did. Nobody had more spirit than we did. And I think mo nobody had more relief than we did. I think that's what did it for us. I really have to give respect to, to all generations of the Corps, because I think at some point um, it, it was the thing to do when you couldn't be in the marching band at Champaign or Urbana High School, uh, you could be in the Douglas Center Drum Corps or drill team. 
if you, it was an open door policy. So if you came in, you were willing to, to, to practice, to learn the numbers, to learn the drill team's procedures, um, then you could do it. Uh, but each one of those generations brought something to the table and we learned and picked up numbers for them and we, we, we carried on a, a strong, strong tradition. And, and I'm very, very sad that that tradition ended at some point. I don't think the original drum corps did stop. The guys got older and, and uh, went, you know, uh, quit. But when the, I think when Radliff uh, left when he when he was no longer the leader. There was nobody being trained or nobody interested in uh, maintaining that, that leadership, taking on that leadership. But fortunately, there's a young man now uh, who's Matt Liff is. I understand Matt Liff is training to be a leader. He he has the natural leadership skills and abilities, but there he needs encouragement, you know, so to be a leader. I started playing drums at five years old at church, you know, and then at like when I got in middle school, I, I learned how to play like in a band, you know, and play coordinated. And I was like playing basketball at Douglas every day. Then I seen Jesse one day playing drums, and I'm like, I want to get down with that because I've been playing drums since I was a shorty. I just liked what they was playing, you know. And I seen a lot of kids over there, so I'm like, maybe I can teach them what somebody taught me. Um, Jesse inspired me. He was, a, he like, showed me that, you know, they've been doing this for a long time. He wanted to keep it going, and he was on the same thing I was on because I love music just like he do. Jesse, he was cool, you know, because like, I like in Chicago where I'm from. If you're trying to just walk up to a band, you can't do that. Like in Chicago, you got to go through all type of stuff. Jesse let me walk up and strap straight up. And I showed Jesse what I hear, and Jesse was feeling what I was doing, you know. He's like, oh, man, that, that's what you on? I'm like, yeah, that's what I do, you know. I'm like, this how, is this how I play. So then as me and Jesse got them rapping, got the talking, I'm like, Jesse, I'll take over, you know. Let me, let me do this. The kids adapting to me, you know. I had like 50-some kids up inside of Douglas Park. You know, I'm talking about from five to like 14 kids, you know, already, I already played drums. I had so many kids and want enough drums. I had people on cymbals. I had two people to a drum at one time for everybody can learn parts, you know. But yeah, the kids loved me and Jesse, he, he introduced me to it, so I was thankful for that. Anyway, he's a young man. Uh, he hasn't reached his 20s yet. But it's certain skills that he has uh, that stand out. For one, he's a good drummer. When we when we was in, um, in middle school, we won every competition, you know. And then what made me so proud was they put lead drum and they had my name in a plaque in my old school. It's still there to this day, Lee Duncan, lead drummer. And I felt so good because I'm like, how did I become the lead drummer? And all these older people was over me like this, and I learned from them. And then how did I get better than them, you know? But they say you learn from your teacher, then you get better than your teacher, you know. And then I guess that's how it was, and I was the lead drummer. It's in Chicago at Michelle Clark High School, you know, and I felt good about that. Every time I go up there and I see that, you know, it gave me more courage to keep going on. For two, he's patient with the little guys. I got so many talented drummers up in my, in my band. It's ridiculous, I'm talking about. And then, you know, it's like, I got these two little dudes, you know, Ricky and Lil Duke, you know, they. They outstanding on the bass drum, and you know they don't want to try to play no other drum. They know what they good at, you know, and that's what they want to play. You feel I'm kind of young, you know, so the kids like, oh, he ain't grown. We ain't gotta listen to him. Some of the kids do it like that, but Duke, Duke and Ricky, they never did that to me. Even when all the other kids caught their little attitudes or whatever, and they wanted to leave, Duke and Ricky was still right there by my side. So when I come to practice today, I'm gonna make them my um, session leaders. He, he has all it takes to be a leader.
I think I work with young people for the majority of my adult life. To knowing that you have a kind of impact on somebody's life, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility, and that's, that's the most significant thing that um, I've had to come to grips with. Uh, I never realized I never realized how many guys, girls, just walk up and and say how much they miss me, how much I meant to them. It's it's, it's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. I need the kids to be 100% sure about that's what they want to do, play these drums. And I'm going to be 100% sure that I'm going to direct them and teach them and keep learning new things. I need people for the community to come out and support the kids so they can know. Because, you know, if a kid, it like if somebody feel like, Okay, I'm doing good, and there's people around me that's seeing that I'm doing good, and they around that supporting. Support is everything. If you ain't got no support, you're like, oh, I'm just doing this for nothing, you know? But when you got that, the like crowds of people around you while you playing, I'm telling you, the little drill teams, them work, you know? Because most guys, they, oh, girls? Girls finna be dancing to our music? Okay, let us play. Let us learn how to play this real quick so they can make up this dance to it, you know? Because I know that's how I was in middle school. So, you feel me? I need the PAR district help, and I need as much as help as I can get, you know, because, like, we need new sticks, mallets, and everything, but we, we ain't got all the new sticks and mallets and everything, but we work with what we got, you know, because that's, that's how I learned. All you need is determination, and you can do it.